We have handout notes available, like always. If you um, didn't notice, it's on the back side of your bulletin. And if you don't have one, just raise your hand. We'll have one of our ushers get a copy to you. Uh, again, if um, you're interested in being baptized, make sure you talk to me at some point, either today or this week. Uh, for at this point, it's on the schedule for next Sunday, and, uh, or this upcoming Sunday, if you need clarification. And uh, it's always a possibility that it could be postponed a week or so, but it's on the schedule for this upcoming Sunday. So let me know if you're interested or if you have questions about baptism, what that means, and uh, we will um, hire the crew to go and chop the hole in the ice in the lake, and it'll be a really exciting, thrilling, refreshing time uh, of baptism. And actually, that, that's uh, an exaggeration. We will just take the cover off of the baptismal back here. So it can actually be done in a warm, uh, a warm baptismal, if you prefer, which most people do. Anyway, we're going to be in John chapter 16 today, so you can turn there. And even as we were talking last week in John 16 about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the helper who is the teacher, I think it would be highly appropriate for us to go to the Lord and ask for that ministry to be at work in our lives today. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would teach us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that he would open our eyes, our spiritual eyes, that he would make the truths of Scripture very bright, that we can see them and understand not only what it says, but what it means and then how it applies to our current situations and that it would be written deeply into our hearts that these things we would never forget. And so, Lord, we, we pray that you would speak to each of us as we need it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you're turning to John 16, uh, for those of you who like these, I have a few quick riddles to help you get your mind active and going if the caffeine is still waiting to kick in from the coffee. So see if you can. You don't have to shout these out loud. If you know the answer, but I just have a few riddles for you, little mental exercises. Here we go, riddle number one. I am the ruler of shovels. I have a double. I am as thin as a knife. I have a wife. Who am I? Oh, ace of spades. Did somebody say that? Is that what I heard? The ace of spades. You get it? You know, in the cards? Okay. He's got a wife, the queen of spades, right? Thin. He is thin. A spade is a shovel. Okay, you know, no, you got it. The riddle, here's another one. Prepare your heart for this one. A woman shoots her husband. Then she holds him underwater for fi over five minutes. Finally, she hangs him. But then, five minutes later, the two of them go out and enjoy a wonderful dinner together. How can this be? The woman is a photographer using actual film, and so she shoots a picture of him, and in her own uh, dark room, she develops the picture and hangs it to dry, and they go out and have dinner. Yeah, you're thinking, oh, you know, you know, with today, you don't use the dark room anymore. But from those of you who were in high school back in the 90s, and you had photography class, and you, you know what I'm talking about there, that, that, that answers the, the question there for you. Here's another one. A boy was at a carnival and went to a booth where a man said to the boy, if I write your exact weight on this piece of paper, you owe me $50. And if I miss it, if I don't, then I'll give you $50. The boy looked around and he didn't see any scale and so he figured this one's easy. Um, whatever he says, I can just tell him I weigh more or less. There's no way to validate it. So he says, deal. A few moments later, the boy walks off having paid the man at the booth $50. How can that be? Oh, exactly. He wrote, just as he said, your exact weight on the piece of paper. And you can't argue with that. That was the deal. Here's another one. A teacher was talking with his students. And he said to them, in a little while, I will die and no longer see you. You will no longer see me. But then in a little while, you will see me again. How can this be? How can this be? You're like, oh, shush, shush, shush. I think that's Jesus, you know, whispering, Jesus, 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 Jesus. It sounds like, shush, shush, shush. That's, what, that's exactly right. You're on the right track. You say it's impossible. 
unless it is Jesus speaking with his disciples, saying, yes, I'm going to leave you, I will die, but I will see you again because I will rise again from the dead. Only possible through Jesus Christ. Go ahead and open your Bibles again. I'm sure you're there by now. John 16, starting in verse 16. We're going to see Jesus tell his disciples this very riddle, so to speak. He's going to continue to reveal vague details of what was coming without revealing too much specific information. I mean, you have to, you know, when you approach it with your mind, you say, now Jesus, you could have been a bit more clear in what you're saying to these guys. Um, but it's true. He was being quite vague, giving information through veiled terms. And we wonder why. Why was he always speaking this way, or oftentimes speaking this way with his disciples? Even in close quarters with just them, why? Well, we can only speculate. May have been from keeping them from trying to oppose the plan or to suggest all these changes, or maybe in their attempt to help the plan, they get in the way and make it more complicated. We don't know why he didn't always give the specific details that you and I know looking back on the story. But he gave the reasons in basic details that after the fact would make perfect sense to them. And what Jesus is going to go on to say in many ways will bring great sorrow to their hearts. But he's also going to leave them with some promises that they uh, will be able to experience joy in the midst of the sorrow that they're facing now and in the time to come. So let's uh, go ahead and take a look at what John records Jesus uh, speaking here. These final words uh, of instruction from this discourse, starting in verse 16. A little while, and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Some of his disciples then said to one another, What is this thing he is telling us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, What is this that he says, a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him, and he said to them, are you deliberating together about this? That I said a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world, and I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. 
I have overcome the world. That last statement there is extra exciting, isn't it? I have overcome the world, Jesus says. Well, these words right here were Jesus' final pre-crucifixion teachings to his disciples according to the Gospel of John. He is concluding the extended period of time he's been teaching them on this one night, but it started all the way back in John chapter 13 when they made their way to the upper room of that borrowed home. And so this concludes that discourse. The very next time we see Jesus speaking, it's in chapter 17, and it's to his Father in prayer on their behalf. So, as we have seen really through all, up the, through all this discourse, even up through into the text today, the uh, disciples have had such great sorrow in their hearts. Jesus, their teacher, their master, is going to be leaving them through death. But in this troubling time, these sorrowful circumstances, Jesus is going to be giving them some promises that they can hold on to. And uh, these promises that they can hold on to, that they could to bring them peace and joy and sorrow, are promises that are good for you and for me that we too can hang on to in distressful, sorrowful circumstances, allowing us to have peace and joy. And due to the providence of God working in all things mysteriously, it's possible that today you are here and you are facing troubling circumstances, sorrowful circumstances. Well, Jesus will say that you can have joy, that you can have peace, despite what you're going through. And maybe you're here today and you say, no, things are good, like I'm rejoicing, life's good right now. Good, take these notes down because we always endure and face troubling times in life and we'll need to be able to lean on these promises Jesus speaks of. So, you say, how is it possible to have our sorrow turned into joy, to have peace in the midst of these difficulties of life? We're going to take a look at these four promises, but before we do that, let's get a closer look at what we find in verses 16 through 18, where we notice these sorrowful circumstances. Jesus has been alluding to his upcoming departure that has so troubled their hearts many times on this final night with them. But here we get, we see him doing it yet again, but this time kind of in a, a riddle of sorts. At least before the events that he's describing take place, the exact terms that he's using were vague. They didn't give specific details. It was almost uh, a bit of a, a riddle that couldn't be solved until after everything took place, at which time everything that he said would become crystal clear. He said, a little while, and you will no longer see me. And again, in a little while, and you will see me. Again, why does he use such inexact terms to these guys? He could have told them, look, we're gonna make our way up this ravine to the Garden of Gethsemane shortly thereafter. I mean, I'm I'm gonna pray for you. And then Judas, remember he left during the, the supper we had? He went over to gather the Roman cohort and some other temple officials and some other Pharisees. They're gonna meet us there and uh, they're, they're going to arrest me. You guys are going to run around and scatter and hide. And tomorrow, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die on the cross. But three days later, I'm going to rise again. And I'm going to continue on for 40 days with you guys, ministering to you. I'm going to then ascend into heaven. And from there, I will send the Holy Spirit that I've been telling you about. And he's going to go forth And as troubling as this is going to seem, at least up front, it's going to be okay because this is going to be the way that I will pay for your sins and provide you with forgiveness and eternal life. Now, couldn't Jesus have just said that? He could have very easily said that. Instead, he just says, a little while and you will no longer see me. And again, in a little while and you will see me. You know, he has a purpose behind this. 
And again, we can only speculate why he's only giving them enough information that after the fact it will make crystal clear sense. You know, you and I, we look at this and we say, I know exactly what Jesus is saying here. But until you walk through that time and see those plans unfold, it was still very mysterious to these fellows. Now, we see their response in verse 17. The disciples began to talk amongst themselves, saying, what does all this mean? What does it mean that we will not see him? What does it mean that then we will see him? What does it mean that he's going to the Father? And what does it mean that he says a little while? I mean, basically, they didn't get anything that he said. They had confusion on every point. But... Honestly, if we were in their shoes, we'd probably be thinking similarly. But their response was a complete lack of understanding. Jesus will continue on to describe a few more things, and they get to a point down in verse 29 when they're like, ah, lo, I guess is their, we, I almost say, ah, now you're speaking plainly. Lo, now you're speaking plainly, they said to him. <laughs> so they think they begin to understand. But what really does Jesus mean through these items he told them there in verse 16? Let's see the resolution to this, this riddle. When Jesus says, a little while and you will no longer see me, he's talking about his death that would take place the next day. In only a few short hours, he would be on the cross, crucified. Some of his disciples wouldn't see him even in a shorter amount of time than that. Once they got to the garden and Judas showed up with the mob, uh, they would have, they took him and a lot of the disciples scattered and didn't see him again. But some guys like Peter and John, they followed along and uh, they saw him for a little while longer. But it was ultimately fulfilled when he was crucified, taken down, and then entombed. So from that very moment that Jesus is saying this to them, it would literally be in just a little while, just a couple more hours and they would no longer see him. Now, the second part of this statement says, and again, a little while, and you will see me. Here he's talking about three days after his death when he rises again from the dead. At this point, you know, at his resurrection, we read in Acts chapter 1, uh, he, he is going to continue on for another 40 days on earth in his glorified body, appearing to different uh, individuals, ministering, restoring relationship like with Peter, and uh, confirming with no doubt whatsoever the fact that he actually rose again bodily, physically. And so that's the clearest fulfillment of Jesus, met, what he meant there. But there is another aspect of the fulfillment of that second statement that took place on the day of Pentecost when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to them. We don't see it reflected in our English text, but in the original Greek, in Jesus making this statement, these two words that are translated see into the English, they're two different Greek words with a slightly different shade of meaning. The first word when he says, um, in a little while you will no longer see me, that word translated see there has the idea of beholding with the eyes just exactly like we would assume that it means. That uh, it's physically behold them with their physical eyes. But the second half of the statement, when he says, and then you will see me, that word see, the Greek word there has the idea of seeing with insight, seeing with discernment of the spiritual realities, seeing the deeper more profound reality behind just the visual that they're seeing with their eyes. And so at the festival of Pentecost that's recorded there in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit, he began through his enlightening of their, their minds and the illumination of the truth, they would see Jesus in a whole new light. Not just see him with the physical eyes, but they would begin to see him in a deeper way with the spiritual realities uh, in it all. And so, succinctly, in what Jesus is saying here, in a little while, he'd be captured and crucified. They wouldn't see him. Then in a little while after that, on the third day, he would rise again from the dead. So they would see him. But then, when the Holy Spirit would be sent, 
they would see Jesus on a much deeper, more profound level, a clearer level than they ever had before. So that's really the meaning, the full meaning behind what Jesus is saying here. Uh, the disciples would pick up maybe a little bit of this as he carried on, but it wouldn't be until after they experienced all of this that all of these truths became fully uh, aware in their minds. Something, though, that we notice, we can't, we can't miss it. I mean, it's been throughout this whole final discourse from Jesus is the disciples are so full of sorrow. Looking back at verse 6, he says, Because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. What's that, like 10 minutes before the text that we're reading today, he said this to them? This is really overwhelming them. Look forward to verse 20. He spoke of what they would be feeling in the next few hours. He said, truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament. These disciples were at that moment, and they would continue to face great sorrow. In verse 21, he compares their upcoming time of trouble to a woman facing labor pains. Jesus would be leaving them, and they would remain in the world. Look at what he says in verse 33. And in the world, you have tribulation. So these guys were facing difficult days at that moment, and they were in for many more and so Jesus wanted to, in acknowledging their sorrowful circumstances, now give them some promises that they could hold on to to give them some strength and courage as they move through these trying times. Let's move on and see these promises. Verses 19 through 33. Four promises we want to identify. These were uniquely for them, yes, but they are also for all disciples. If you have received Jesus as your Savior, if you have been born again, these promises are true for you and for me, and we can hang on to these. The first one that he gives us, uh, that he gives them, is actually one he's elaborated on in our past studies, the last several weeks. Uh, and it's the promise that really has set up now the statement that he's going to make with all of these other three. But it's the promise that we have a helper. Verses 5 through 15, um, again, our previous text, but then we go back into chapter 15 and we go back into chapter 14, all of these teachings on this one night. He says we have a helper. One reason the disciples could be comforted and have peace and joy in the midst of the difficulty is that they would soon have a helper. Who's the helper? Jesus says it's the Holy Spirit. We're not going to spend a ton of time, you know, rehearsing all of these things that we've studied the last few weeks, but just to point out several reasons why having a helper would be so encouraging and, and so uh, promoting of peace and joy in their lives. First of all, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the parakletos. Remember that Greek term, the parakletos? in the original Greek. And that word itself, it's translated helper here, but it can be translated in, in many different ways that really share the different varieties or shades of ministry that the Holy Spirit does that's kind of just summarized in saying He comes alongside of you and helps you where you are no matter what you're facing. Uh, it, those it could be translated comforter as it is in some of your translations, perhaps comforter or counselor or advocate. Uh, it can be translated encourager. But it's the one who comes alongside to help. Knowing that God is there, the helper, to help you no matter what it is you're facing, that gives more peace and joy. We learned that the Holy Spirit would bring back to their remembrance all that Jesus said. And he would actually teach them what it meant, guiding them into the truth. Surely that would be comforting and relieving and joy-provoking, knowing that all the confusion and the things that I've forgotten, it's all going to be cleared up once the Holy Spirit, the Helper, uh, is sent. 
Third, the Holy Spirit would convict the world concerning the world's disbelief in Jesus, their need of Jesus' righteousness, and the coming judgment if they don't turn to Jesus. And so as these men are left to go and preach the message of the gospel, the comforting message in having the helper is that the helper, the Holy Spirit, is going to go and do the work of convicting the heart. That's not on them. They just preach the message. And the Holy Spirit will go forth and convict the hearts. And then forth in John 14, 17, we see Jesus told them that the Holy Spirit <clears throat> would abide in them. You know, Jesus was also called a helper, and he was with them. But when he would leave, he would send the Holy Spirit to be in them. The very Spirit of God would be in them every moment of every day, wherever they were. So, one reason these disciples could have peace and joy despite the sorrowful circumstances was because they had the Holy Spirit as their helper. And something you and I need to know and reflect upon is that this is true for all born-again believers. If you've received Jesus as your Savior, whether or not you even know this, uh, the Holy Spirit began to indwell you that moment you believed. And He has been there as your ever-present helper. What, uh, what we need to do, though, is walk in that reality to actually depend upon Him for help. He is there as our helper, our comforter, our counselor, our advocate, our encourager. And so if you're in the midst of troubling circumstances today, be aware of that reality and begin to walk in light of it. And uh, if you say, no, nah, life's good, we'll continue to walk in that reality. You have a helper, the Holy Spirit, and you will need Him in the good times and in the difficult ones. There's another promise Jesus gives. Secondly, our sorrow will be turned to joy. That sounds exciting just at first, at, at first uh, listen. Jesus actually promised that these disciples, their sorrow would be turned into joy. Jesus would die and leave them, yes, but he would rise again, conquering death, and they would see him again. There would be a sorrowful moment, but that sorrow would turn into joy. And uh, Jesus actually illustrates this through the, uh, using the concept of a pregnant woman. And so for those of you who, uh, ladies who are pregnant here today, and uh, just focus on the second portion, uh, not the pain and agony portion that he brings up. So just fast forward to the end, because it's a good illustration he uses. But he says it's like a woman who reaches the, uh, the, the, the end of her pregnancy. You know, the hour has come. She's gone into labor. She is in pain. But after a little while, the baby is born, and there's such joy over the birth of that baby that the pain disappears. You don't even remember the pain. How many of you ladies that uh, were very joyful that your baby was born, uh, you say, I... I really don't have a firm grasp on the pain. I don't raise your hand in case some of you are like, no, I remember that pain. <laughs> and uh, through pain, I brought in that little pain in the neck. <laughs> so, you know, we're careful. But many of you ladies, you understand that have been through this what Jesus is talking about. Now, Jesus was no woman, and he never, but he was created. Uh, he created the, uh, the concept of birth and all of that. And so he can speak uh, rightly from experience. Don't you go shaking your finger at Jesus and saying, yeah, typical man, never had, never had a baby, doesn't know what he's talking about. No, it's a good fitting illustration. Jesus may use this as the creator of man and woman and conception and, and birth. But he says it's like that. There is so much joy that you don't even think about the pain. He's saying that, um, and uh, really, I think we need to take it even a bit further, though. Because I believe what Jesus is saying here is more than just, hey, there's pain in this moment. 
And then there's joy because the pain goes away. And the pain goes away, and then you can say, relief, now I'm, now I'm happy. Jesus, it goes beyond this, I think, what Jesus is saying. He's saying that the same event that was so sorrowful to them would be the same exact event that would bring them joy. The same moment of sorrow, even though it was difficult to face in the moment, caused some of the greatest things to occur as a result. And as a result of that painful moment, everything worked out for the very best in the end. Think about Jesus' situation here. He died. That caused sorrow because his disciples saw him suffer and he left and he was gone and their hearts were broken. But he rose from the dead. We say, well, that caused them joy because they could now see him again. But it goes beyond that. That brief time of sorrow actually was the same event that allowed for greater joy and blessing to follow than they could ever imagine. For through his death, as painful as it would have been to see, through his death that was necessary, he provided the forgiveness of sins and the offer of eternal life in heaven. You see, what they had before with Jesus with them, that was good and they could be joyful. But because they face this time of sorrow, they would be able to have a greater joy and blessing in the future. Now, this was exactly true of this event for the disciples in his day, but in principle, this is true for you and me today. We face times of distress and sorrow in life, but God can and use them for things that can, in the end, bring about greater joy greater joy than we would have known before that time of sorrow. Sometimes, because of God's special way of working all things out from an eternal perspective together, that very situation that is so sorrowful in your life can also be the exact same situation that you'll look back upon and say, that produces great amounts of joy for me. During that time of sorrow we face, we don't always know how it will work out for good in the end. Sometimes we say, I can't even fathom how anything could ever be salvaged from this mess. Well, God, he knows what you're facing. And if you're facing a time of sorrow today, you may not be able to even imagine how there could be any joy in the end, even reflecting upon the sorrowful circumstances in your life today. But Jesus promised the disciples joy that the actual sorrow and the sorrowful event would become joy and a source of their joy. We have a similar promise in Romans 8, 28. A lot of you know this promise. You've memorized it because you've hung on to it so many times in life. But it says there, Paul says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so if you meet the conditions of this verse, meaning that you love God and you're called according to his purpose, then you can be rest assured that all things he works together for good, even those distressful, sorrowful things. It takes great faith to be able to hang on to that. But take comfort in Jesus' instruction from this today. And if you don't need it now, hang on to it for the next time you face a a season of sorrow and difficulty. We've seen two promises. Let's now see a third. Verses uh, 25, 23 through uh, 28. We have the power of prayer. In these few verses, Jesus teaches them a couple of new things, but a lot of it's just reminders of some very important basic elements of prayer. Verse 23, we learn that we need to ask the Father. He says, In that day you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. You know, a basic element of prayer is that our asking, our petitions, are to be directed to God the Father. 
That doesn't mean we can't thank and praise the Lord Jesus Christ or ask the Spirit to help us understand something as we read. But technically speaking, when we pray and when we bring requests, we go to the Father in heaven. Look down to verse 26. Jesus has something very interesting and wonderful. He says, In that day you will ask in my name. And you know, I, I do not say to you that I uh, will request of the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. What he's saying here is that we don't need to go and ask Jesus something and hope that Jesus, because he's the only begotten Son of God, that he and he's got you know, special access to the Father, that he will come and he'll butter up the Father and you know, get the Father to do whatever because we've asked Jesus to go and you know, bring the big request to the Father. No, Jesus says, you go straight to the Father. The Father wants you to come to Him personally. He loves it when you do this. Why? Because He absolutely loves you. Look what Jesus says there. The Father Himself loves you. Yes, Jesus will always intercede for us in heaven. Uh, that's part of His high priestly ministry. But Jesus is saying, you don't have to go and ask me to go and ask on your behalf. You just take your request directly to the Father because he loves you and he wants to uh, answer you. Let's look for another uh, basic element here. Verse 23 to 24, we need to ask in Jesus' name. Second half of verse 23 and on, truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have not asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. And then down in verse 26, again, in that day, you will ask in my name. They weren't asking in his name to begin with because they were just asking him, right, when he was with them. But... We have seen this statement by Jesus that you need to ask in his name many times so far. And uh, what this does not mean is that that little phrase, in Jesus' name, is just a tagline you put anywhere to highly emphasize what you want and that God will automatically grant whatever that request is. Like just take a piece of paper, write what you want, and then at the end, just tag on it, in Jesus' name. And then it's, it's done. That's not what Jesus is saying here. We have broken this apart in previous studies. But asking in Jesus' name is asking in line with and in the character of Jesus. Asking what he would ask. Praying the prayers he would pray. Praying in line with the will and plan of God surrendering to what his ultimate best plan is. Even in John 15, verse 7, Jesus connects abiding in him with powerful prayer. That's when he says, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Remember, we looked at that, and we're like, ooh, what do you wish upon a star, wish in a wishing well, you know, wish blow out the candles, make a wish, or just go and ask Jesus whatever you wish. Well, he connected that one with abiding in him. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, that's the condition. God's word is abiding in you and you yourself are abiding in Jesus Christ. So you have a good understanding of his heart and his will and his plan. And then you pray in his name. And we get to rejoice for answered prayer. Notice, when we pray to the Father in Jesus' name, there's a third truth here he teaches that we will receive. Another way you could say this is that God answers prayer. If we pray according to the way we're supposed to pray, we bring our request to the Father in the name of Jesus, we can be assured he will answer. I'll tell you, this leads to the fourth teaching, end of verse 24 it will result in abundant joy. Jesus says, ask, 
and you will receive. Why? So that your joy may be made full, he said. Answered prayer brings an immense amount of joy. Think back into a time in your life where there was a heavy need. You felt compelled to pray, and so you pray. You went to the Father, and you asked in Jesus' name, and he granted your very request unmistakably as an answer prayer. What did that do to your heart? It brought you joy, immense joy. The fact that we have the power of prayer is so comforting and uplifting in sorrowful times. Prayer works. James says in James 5.16, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And so when we face a distressful time, pray. Allow God to do the work as we pray. And finally today, one final promise Jesus gives for these disciples to hang on to. Fourth, we can claim his peace. We can claim his peace. In verse 29, the disciples think they're finally figuring out these complicated, vague things Jesus is saying, and they say, you know, lo, now, now you're speaking plainly. But Jesus knew their hearts. He knew what was actually coming, the details of what was coming. Um, but they still, they had a good statement. Verse 30, what did they say? They said, now we know that you know all things. So they're confessing his omniscience. We, you know it all. You have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. So that statement seems pretty good. I mean, it really is good. But Jesus knows their hearts and he knows the details of what's coming up and just how tragic it is going to be from their perspective. And so he responds with a question regarding their faith. He says, do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered and leave me alone. They say they believe, but just in a couple more hours, Judas would show up along with that army and capture Jesus. And the disciples, as Jesus said, they would, and it was a fulfillment of prophecy that they would be scattered. Peter fought for just a second but even he scattered and then went on to deny even knowing Jesus three times later that night. Well, this lack of peace that they were going to experience in the world is summed up very well at the end of verse 33. He says this, in the world you have tribulation. The world is full of tribulation. And the disciple of Jesus Christ, like these guys, you, me, we, will face sorrow and tribulation while we are here. But Jesus promises peace. What does he say there in verse 33? These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But in me you can have peace. We, we are in a, uh, a unique position in this physical life, for we have two positions going on. Physically, we're present in this world, but at that same time, spiritually, we are in Christ. So despite the tribulation and the sufferings of this world, in Christ, in abiding in Him, we can have peace. How is this possible? Final thing that he says there. He says, I have overcome the world. That world that is oppressing and opposing, persecuting, making life difficult for you. That world has been overcome, has been defeated by Jesus. And so it's in our connection with him and abiding in him that we can claim his peace in the midst of what's going on. So as we conclude here, I hope that you've gained some good insight into this, your current situation. You know, if you're facing some sorrow or difficulty, know that you can still hang on to these promises. And if your life's good right now, wonderful. 
hang on to these promises anyway. You're going to need them because in this world you will have tribulation. But in Christ, you can have peace and joy. But what wonderful teaching and advice from Jesus. Perhaps these guys would have liked clearer information regarding that riddle-like statement about not seeing him and then seeing him. But as he was describing just vaguely, not giving too much information, but just enough that there's going to be sorrowful days ahead, he then graciously gave them these promises to help them stay encouraged and joyful. From this moment on, he has now concluded his teaching. He had already told them, we saw it last week, that he had so much more to say, but they couldn't bear it. Well, from this point on, they're going to make their way, that final uh, move to the garden. And uh, Jesus is going to pray for them. And, uh, you know, he, he knew what he was going to face later that night. He knew what the disciples were going to face later that night and in the days and months and years ahead. So he did the greatest thing that he could do for them at this moment. He prayed for them. And as we dive into this prayer in the weeks to come, we're going to see that Jesus actually prays for you in this text. For you. Not by your name, unless you have a word that, you know, fits that his prayer for you. But he prays for you and me. Pretty exciting. We'll take a look at that in the weeks to come. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for... Jesus' teaching here, and of course, we covered a lot of material today. We pray that you would help the Holy Spirit to, uh, that you would use the Holy Spirit to help us to remember these things, that we would not only understand them, but that in the days ahead when we need them, that he would call to remembrance these things that Jesus has taught us through this, through this text, and that we would be able to, even in the midst of sorrow, have great joy and peace that though in this world physically we face tribulation, that in Jesus, in abiding in him, we can have peace. And now as we go forth today, may we just keep pressing on in you, Lord God, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for uh, joining us here today. We will uh, plan to carry on in John 17 next week. So uh, come back for that or tune in online. Thank you all for being here. May God bless you. We are dismissed.